Well, welcome back to Faith Team TV, speaking to the issues shaping our nation. And today we're discussing the sexualization of our schools and tools for parents to navigate it all with Phil Lees from Parents as First Educators based in Ontario and John Hilton O'Brien of Parents for Choice in Education from Alberta. is authoritarianism. It's all about the transfer of power from parents to central authorities. When we talk about sexual and gender minority issues, the way it cashes out is the school system saying, oh, you shouldn't tell your parents, in which we're discussing very significant things at an extremely early age. Of the 103 studies that Comprehensive Sex Ed uses, there were only six that demonstrated an improvement in sexual activity. 17 of them actually led to higher increased sexual activity. Thanks for joining me today. Our topic today is one that I regularly hear from viewers about and I've had multiple requests to do repeated shows on. I'm talking about our kids and our public schools and really there's little that moves our hearts more but let's face it. Parents, grandparents, and caregivers have been walking off their maps these past years with an onslaught of social changes largely driven by the digital internet world and social agendas, which some feel have moved public education away from the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic towards controversial ideological grooming, at times shaping the minds of our little ones in a direction that parents don't feel comfortable with and sometimes feel powerless to even speak into. The most sensitive of conversations often often hover around sexual curriculum in schools, masking, and the COVID-19 vaccine for kids. Over the past years, there have been numerous instances where children were actually exposed to controversial sex-based teachings and even vaccinated without parental consent. So it's very understandable that today's topic is sensitive and of interest to many parents. With the number of Canadian children in our public school system, this is not an inconsequential discussion. In 2020, there were almost 6 million students enrolled in elementary and secondary school programs in Canada. The vast majority of students, 91.8%, attended public schools, while only 7.6% attended private schools, with BC and Quebec having the highest number of students in private education. In addition, enrollment in homeschooling has increased over the last few years, with the Prairie Provinces having the highest numbers averaging between 1.2 and 2% of children in the homeschooling programs. The Atlantic provinces follow with almost 1% of children being schooled at home. With the changing landscape, more and more parents are looking at the options that are available to them and also looking for resources on how they can ensure that their kids are getting the best education possible. And that's what my two guests today are all about. Phil Lees has experience as a public educator and a teacher consultant since 1995 he's been at it. He has also been called upon by governments internationally to testify as an expert on the topic at hand and his organization Parents as First Educators produces resources to help parents navigate the public school terrain. John Hilton O'Brien is the Executive Director of Parents for Choice in Education. This is an Alberta based nonprofit dedicated to informing, equipping, and mobilizing citizens towards quality education, which recognizes parental authority. Thanks so much for joining us today for this very important conversation for our nation. Let's get to it. If you aren't teaching your kids about sex, who is? For 20 years, Peace has been empowering families to positively disciple and mentor their children on difficult cultural issues in education, such as sexuality. In our five-step process, first parents engage the facts. They first learn to understand what is being taught in school and why. Next, the peaceful process how to build positive relationship with their child's teacher so that when it comes time to discuss sensitive issues, they're openly accepted. Third, how to engage your child on the issue of human sexuality. And we have resources 
to help parents to become the trusted adult and the trusted source of information. And lastly, how to engage your school. And we have resources to help parents to communicate with the school, to build understanding of the faith needs of the family so that learning for the child is more effective. When it comes to the decisions that a child makes about sexuality, the research shows that children make decisions based upon a consistent message coming to them from parents, the church, and ideally the school. Peace has resources to help the church and to help parents to provide a consistent, biblically aligned message. Parents tell us that having conversations around sexuality is sometimes difficult. Building Family Connections is a training program that we offer to parents that gives them a toolkit in order to help them to have those conversations and really take the leadership role with their children in the area of sexuality. All right, John Hilton O'Brien and Phil Lees, this is a massive conversation for many of our viewers right now. Really appreciate you guys joining me today. Thank you for inviting us. Great to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Well, let's start with who's who in the zoo here. Uh, tell us about your organizations, what you guys do, and maybe a little bit about why you got involved in this discourse. So, Phil, why don't you go first? I, I, well, I spent 30 years uh, in the education system, right, as a teacher, a curriculum consultant, and a couple of years even at the Ministry of Education. Um, and in 1995, um, I was running a specialty program. I had kids coming in to see me from all over the school board. And at certain times of the year, the conversations in the classroom became rather sexual. And I asked the question, what's going on? And they said, oh, it's sex ed, sir. And so I investigated the new, you know, the new, new you know, comprehensive sex ed curriculum coming into the schools. And I said, what's the research to support this? I couldn't find any. And so at that time, we started just informing parents about the new curriculum that was coming into the school. At that time, it was just basically saying to kids, you know, if you're going to be sexually active, then use a condom. All right. It has grown since then. And uh, we've actually now are running, um, <laughs> actually running uh, grant programs uh, in the United States in what's called sexual risk avoidance education. So, so our focus has gone from just informing parents to uh, about what's happening in the schools to equipping them to guide their kids despite what's happening in schools. Well, well, thank you so much for what you do, Phil. I know a lot of parents deeply appreciate and value the work of your organization. John, uh, tell us a little bit about your group, Parents for Choice in Education. Sure. We're an advocacy organization primarily, currently based in Alberta. And we started because we were concerned by this combination of increasingly authoritarian approaches to government combined with some utopian thinking. Our aha moment was a lobbying effort launched about 12 years ago with the support of a former Alberta Minister of Education. And they were trying to eliminate Catholic education in Alberta, which is huge. And when we talk about the enormous amount of school choice available in Alberta for parents, the key to it is Catholic education. If you get rid of that system, everything else can easily be swept away into a single system. The underlying movement to it was still there and would manifest in other ways. And we better start to organize to be able to counter some of this craziness that we're going to see. Well, I'm sure uh, your work resonates deeply, particularly with the, those that have their children in the Catholic school system. So thank you very much. Let me ask you this. You know, we are regularly getting emails, phone calls from concerned parents about what their kids are being exposed to in the public school system. And there's this, this sort of feeling of a lack of uh, power. Like a lot of parents just don't know what they can do to even start the conversations. They're afraid of being shamed, labeled, et cetera, particularly when it comes to the sexual education topic. What are you guys hearing from parents, um, you know, when you're picking up the phones and emails? The issue is authoritarianism. It's all about the transfer of power from parents to central authorities. 
So we talk about critical theory in the schools. Well, the idea behind critical theory is that you should examine the structures of power and you should make sure that they're not oppressive, to make sure that the powerful are giving power to those who are not. But when a school teacher stands up at the front of the room and tells her students that they should check their privilege and give up their power, she's the only person in the room who's going to be receiving that power. This is a subversion of critical theory in the first place. When we talk about sexual and gender minority issues, the way it cashes out is the school system saying, oh, you shouldn't tell your parents. And in Alberta, literally, that teachers are not allowed to tell parents about significant issues in their kids' lives, in which we're discussing very significant things at an extremely early age. And during the school board elections of the past year, we're seeing control of entire school systems like the Toronto public school system going to union endorsed candidates. And so we're seeing an actual takeover of school systems by our teachers unions. And so this authoritarianism is the issue that underlies all other issues. Okay. So basically the mindset that the school system knows best, listen, you got to challenge your parents, you got to challenge anyone that's powerful in your world, uh, really undermining parental authority. So you got to ask, uh, where will this end up, right? Um, you know, you know, and also I need to say this too, because we're, we're right here in the shadows of uh, apologizing to our Indigenous brothers and sisters about the residential school atrocity, which to me feels like such an echo of the same ideology saying like, listen, the government knows better, you know, question your culture, question your language, question how you do things. And as a matter of fact, it's bad and, and we know better. It's a very, very dangerous trend as we see through our history. Phil, why don't you weigh into this conversation? Are you seeing, um, you know, what John's talking about? Most of the calls that we get have to do, uh, particularly in the last six months or so, with the gender identity issue. Um, you know, how can I guide my child and not be in conflict with the school? And you know, and can this can this new conversion therapy uh, legislation actually you know cause me to end up in court? And what I wanted so th that's that's been the focus of many of our conversations. Um, but I want to hitchhike on what you just said about the uh, residential schools uh, and the mistakes that were made back then. Well, the latest research on what we're teaching our children when it comes to comprehensive sex education. Comprehensive sex education started in the mid-1990s, right? And it says, you know, we need to do this because we need a program that's evidence-based, scientific, etc. Well, the last, the, the most current research that's come out by the Institute for Research and Evaluation, it looked at all of the programs that comprehensive sex ed uses to justify, you know, th their program. So all of the research, and of the 103 studies in the United States, Canada, and internationally, there were only six that demonstrated an improvement or a reduction in, in, in sexual activity or reduction in pregnancies, 17 of them actually led to reduced results. It's led to higher increased sexual activity. We surveyed parents, what is it you need to be able to be the first person to inform your child before the school does? Then what the child hears from the school goes through that filter. And that's important to put that in place. We love Canada and we wanna see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference and all gifts are tax deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit fayteen.tv or call 1-866-844-0844 to donate today. The other thing that they've done is they've looked at the research on the gender identity issue. 
And we're told that if we don't take, uh, you know, an affirming care approach to gender identity, that our kids will commit suicide. Okay, and that's that's actually that's actually what doctors are telling our our, our parents, uh, even in the offices. And the research that just came out last month looked at all of the research around the gender identity issue, and and said. None of this is actually scientifically supported. So although comprehensive sex ed has said we have to be based on evidence, science, etc., the research isn't based on evidence and science. What's happened is CECAS and their, um, th their other organization, CCAN, which is the, the Sexual Institute for Education in Canada, right, has uh, made their goal now not health, but changing social norms. Wow. Okay? And as parents, we have to say, like, are we okay with this? You know, these are our tax dollars. These are our kids. So let's talk to parents for a moment. Um, how can parents be powerful in this process? I know, Phil, when I had you back on my show when we were first launching years ago, you used to talk about the importance of the parent-teacher relationship. But where does a parent start in really engaging in this whole process and this conversation? John, why don't you take that one first? The first thing you can go do is you can go to those uh, parent-teacher meetings. And, uh, you know, my father was a holy terror. I actually felt sorry for my teachers. And you don't need to be a complete terror, but you can say, look, you're doing something that I don't want you to do, and I want you to change that. And when you're advocating, there's some specific skill-related things that go knowing how to escalate. So you have to say out front, if you aren't willing to do that, I'm going to have to take this to the principal. If the principal isn't willing to do this, I'll have to talk to the trustee, right? So at each level, you tell them your next step. And you have to be nice as pie about all this. You can never be strident. But there's a third thing you can do. Part of the reason our school boards are so bad is nobody votes. A quarter to a third of the people voting are actually the teachers and related unions. If you go and take part in politics, and I don't, I don't just mean voting here, I mean consider carefully whether God is calling you to take on a public role. And if it's not, then volunteer to help find someone good and help them run for office and donate to their campaigns because these things cost money and we cannot take it for granted. Yeah, and that's a really, really good point. You know, I know at these levels with the school board trustee elections, it's often a couple dozen people, maybe at best a couple hundred that determine who's on the board, who's not on the board. But I find just a lot of parents and just even concerned citizens, they don't really know where to start uh, with determining, you know, who's who in the zoo. But it's really encouraging to me to see that all across Canada, there's organizations like yours, John, that are producing voter guides, you know, when these elections come up. And it's so important to stay connected. Um, Phil, you've been on the other side. You've actually been the teacher. Uh, what are your tips for parents um, at, when it comes to dialoguing with these conversations, these difficult conversations at times? We actually, in the first week of school, we recommend that, you know, give the teacher a little bit of time to settle in and then call and say, you know, could we get together? I'd like to find out who you are and maybe give you some background information that would be more effective when it comes to teaching my child. So you don't call and say, I want to talk and complain. All right. And then when you show up, bring a treat, you know, bring muffins, bring coffee, bring, you know, and be that as, you know, as John says, you want to be that encouraging parent. And you say, when it comes to sex ed, this is this is how we feel. And yes, we accept that everybody has the right, you know, to choose differently, et cetera. But this is how we raise our kids. And we have a form that parents can fill in and just says, if my child is going to be introduced to the following, could you let me know ahead of time? All right. We don't say, 
leave them in the hall. We want to we we want them out of class. But could you let me know ahead of time? And and here are my reasons why. And they can slide in that package, the research. And often the teacher says, I didn't know this. And what happens is what our teachers or our parents are telling us is it often affects how curriculum is delivered in the classroom. And by doing what you're saying, obviously, Phil, too, you're signaling to these teachers right out of the gates that, hey, you're engaged and that you're, you're wanting to engage in a loving, honoring way. And that can be a, a really powerful, powerful thing. So, but let's talk about the, this whole government knows best ideology. What do you say to the parent that actually runs up into that head on where they're basically told, listen, we're not going to tell you because because of this law and that law and this policy, we're actually mandated to keep these conversations private between the counselor and the child. You're not allowed to know. Um, what do parents do if they run up against that type of a, a mindset? The first thing to do is to explain, well, no, I am the parent of the child and this child is a minor. And there is no interpretation of the law that does not include me as the guardian of that child. You cannot keep secrets from me. And sometimes you're going to have to go to the minister in the end, but that's never what you're threatening to do at the start because that dismisses your credibility. But you just have to be willing to walk this up. And you may have to be sitting in Doug Ford's office for all you know. <laughs> For sure, and lobbying your federal representative to bring forward a parental charter of rights, perhaps. I know that's been uh, put out there several times over the last few years by different groups. Um, Phil, what do you say to that parent that's bumping up against this head on? I have to say this, that we haven't yet had a parent come to us and say, okay, when I've asked to be informed about when my child is going to be taught about gender identity, um, we haven't yet had a parent told, no, I won't do that. I'm not saying all teachers comply, but they haven't had that. We haven't had calls with that experience. Where it becomes a concern is if the child of that parent identifies as a gender that's not consistent with their biology, and that puts the teacher in a position where, oh, can I contact the parent or not? What's my legal, what's my position? right? What, you know, will I get in trouble if I do? But if it comes down to a parent not being informed because of the child's, um, and, and the child expresses as a gender different at school than at home, that's, that's a different situation. Okay. Haven't had that, haven't had a call on that yet. People like Phil and I can help. I I do coach parents through how to advocate for themselves sometimes. Once in a while, it becomes a public matter, as in the rather amusing case where uh, a local school had a group in to do talk about sexual consent. And they sent out a, a consent form for the parents to consent to whether their children would take part in it. And they did it as an opt-out form. The equivalent of this in sexual consent would be the defendant saying, well, she didn't say no. She was unconscious, but she didn't say no. And we would call that rape there. And so we actually brought that out in the public view as in the form of uh, an article in a paper. Well, very, very eye-opening for sure. And so what I'm hearing from you guys is stay engaged, stay lovingly engaged, and don't be afraid to ask some of the questions that need to be asked. Because let's face it, we're all walking off our map right now, and teachers included, like you said, Phil. So uh, before we land this plane here with the interview today, um, where can people find you and get the good resources that your organizations provide? If you go to our website, which is parentchoice.ca, you'll find about 10 years worth of information about all sorts of things from how to understand the big ideas and how to advocate for your child. We do a lot of direct advocacy to the government and sometimes that's a sit down with a minister, other times it's a public protest. And by referral, we train people in how to run for office and help people access inexpensive election tools. Fantastic. And Phil, you've got a video series that's coming out, right? I believe it's a six-part video series. Where can people find you and the good resources you're providing? 
Super. Well, you can go to Peace Ontario, peaceontario.com, uh, which is our, our original website. But on the on the YouTube channel, where uh, we have a YouTube channel, and you can Google search Peace Education Services and find the YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, what's happened is is we used to be Peace Ontario. In the last while, we've become a charity, and now it's Peace Education Services. So there's a little reason for the changes. What we did was um, we surveyed parents. And we said, what is it you need to be able to be the first person to inform your child before the school does? Okay, Uh, because if the child hears it from you, then what the child hears from the school goes through that filter. All right. And that's important to put that in place. So we got the responses and they said they wanted videos, uh, an online series. So I've, we're creating, and the fourth one will come out this weekend, uh, a series of six videos that are just about 10 minutes in length that are short ones, but there is a longer eight video series that's being developed, and we're probably about 90% of the way through that. Um, and that will be a series that will have manuals to go with it that churches can use, okay, or that an organization can do an online programming with, etc. Wow, Phil, that's amazing. Thank you so much for responding to the requests of those parents. And I want to accent one thing that you just said there, that whoever has the conversation first basically wins. And just I want to encourage parents to connect with your good resources to have those conversations so that when your kids perhaps get exposed to things, maybe not even just in the classroom, maybe on the schoolyard, that you've had that conversation first. And Phil, your your resources there are amazing. John, thank you so much for what you do. Both of you, thank you for your love for Canada's kids and Canada's parents. And to those of you that are watching this, that you might not have kids that are school age, I'm sure we all know people that do. So please share this show with them and make sure that your friends and family members are aware of these incredible organizations uh, helping uh, Canada's parents. Thanks so much, guys, for joining me today. Thank you, Peyton. Thank you, Peyton. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining me today. We hope you appreciated the conversation. I know there's a lot to chew on in it. If you want to watch the show again and share it with your friends or loved ones, simply visit our website, fateen.tv, where you can find this interview as well as other previous episodes for your viewing convenience. And a wholehearted, huge, massive thank you to our monthly partners and our regular donors. If you are a monthly partner, I want to remind you to be watching for a special gift in the mail that my daughter and I prepared just for you. If you're not a regular donor but would like to become one, we would be so grateful. As a nonprofit TV show, you are the ones that keep us going week after week, having these important conversations for Canada and platforming guests that you may never see on mainstream media. Uh, to help out or give a special year and gift today, simply go to fateen.tv or call us at 1 866 844 and our team would be honored to serve you in any way that we can. Finally, a few reminders we've got our free smart smartphone app and our email list as a free service for you. If you download the app and sign up for those emails, you'll be notified every time a new program is aired so that you never miss a single episode. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again next week.